The Public Education Project of the Society for History and the Federal Government conducts interviews with federal historians about their careers, their agencies, and the government workers who have made memorable contributions to American society. In this interview, Donald Ritchie, historian emeritus of the U.S. Senate, speaks with J. Samuel Walker, the retired historian of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Walker has written several books on nuclear power, including Three Mile Island, A National Crisis in Historical Perspective, published by the University of California Press in 2004. During this interview, Sam Walker recounts the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's involvement in the Three Mile Island Crisis, and particularly the role of Harold Denton, an NRC staff member who became President Jimmy Carter's personal representative at the scene. Denton provided a candid and reassuring voice of reason to the alarmed community around the meltdown. He provides a notable example of a civil servant well prepared to handle an unexpected crisis. Today is uh, Tuesday, August 11th, 2020. This is an interview with J. Samuel Walker, uh, and it is for the Society for History and the Federal Government's PEP project. And so, Sam, thanks very much for agreeing to do this interview today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, sitting in my study and, and talking to Don Ritchie. What, what could be better? <laughs> uh, I thought we'd start off by just sort of describing what is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission? What's it supposed to do? The NRC was created in 1975 as an offshoot of the former Atomic Energy Commission to regulate the safety of nuclear power. Uh, that was, was formally one of three major functions that the AEC performed, and uh, there was always a lot of criticism of the AEC because it had responsibility, statutory responsibility, both to promote the atomic industry and to regulate it. Uh, so in 1974, uh, Congress uh, abolished the AEC and created the NRC to carry out the regulatory duties of that, that the AEC had, had previously been responsible for. So, so the NRC's responsibilities were and are strictly on the regulation of, of um, nuclear power and other um, non-military uses of nuclear energy. Well, if the NRC was a relatively brand new agency, why did it need an historical office and how did you get into it? Well, uh, the AEC had had a splendid historical program and shortly after the NRC began operations in January of 1975, a, a couple of the commissioners, the, uh, the, 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 the governors of the, of the NRC are five co-equal commissioners and at least two of the commissioners thought that it, it made sense for the NRC to continue the AEC's the tradition by having a historical program modeled after uh, the, the, the wonderful program uh, run by Dick Hewlett at the AEC. Um, so, um, so the AEC, the, the, excuse me, the NRC historical program was established in 1977 or 78. It must have been 77. The first historian of the NRC was Roger Trask, a former president and very active member of the Society for History and the Federal Government. Uh, and Roger was allowed to hire an associate historian and he hired George Masusan, uh, another founding member of the society. Um, but after a year or so, Roger uh, wasn't happy at the NRC. He wasn't getting the support that he thought he should have been getting. So, so he, he went back to his academic job at the University of South Florida uh, George was promoted to be the, the, the historian of the NRC, and he hired me as his associate. George and I had been friends at the National Archives, and uh, George knew my work, and so he hired me. And so at that point, uh, when I joined the NRC in 1979, about uh, three months after the Three Mile and Accident, uh, George and I were the two historians of, of the NRC. Uh, George left the NRC in 1986 to become a uh, historian of the National Science Foundation, and I became the historian because uh, there were budgetary constraints and I was not enabled to uh, hire an associate. So I was the sole historian of the NRC from 1986 until I retired in 2010. 
Well, you joined the NRC just a few months after a major event that really uh, impacted the, uh, the, that agency. And that was the uh, crisis at Three Mile Island. And I wonder if you could give a briefly describe just what happened there. Why was it so uh, earth shaking? Well, it was earth shaking for a lot of reasons. Uh, one, no one had ever expected an accident so serious to occur. Uh, and two, uh, because uh, it was such a serious crisis, uh, we found out after the accident, the accident occurred in, in, uh, on March 28, 1979. Um, and, and we found out later, it was not known at the time, uh, that half of the core melted. You, you had a, 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 a very extensive meltdown at Three Mile Island, uh, the worst thing that can happen at a nuclear power plant. So, so in terms of the nuclear industry, and, and, and we forget now, I think, uh, what a huge controversy there was over nuclear power in the 1970s. Uh, it was viewed by, by those who favored the use of nuclear power as the energy source of the future. Uh, it was criticized by those who were against nuclear power as, as, as too expensive, too dangerous, uh, and, um, and, and unnecessary. So you had this huge controversy, and then in, in March of 1979, uh, you, you have a very, very uh, serious accident uh, in which the core melted, and uh, that, kind of, that, that came as the culmination of the controversy over nuclear power in the 1970s. And it also exposed a lot of weaknesses in, in design and in regulation. So, so in terms of the history of the NRC, uh, it was then, uh, it still is the most important single event in the agency's history. But it took place at Three Mile Island, which was in the Susquehanna Valley in, in Pennsylvania. It's a, a relatively rural area. I mean, it's not an urban, highly urban area, and yet there were a lot of people who lived around it. What was the impact of the community uh, by having this uh, meltdown at the, at the, the nuclear reactor? Well, first of all, no one knew it, it was a meltdown. Um, and, and that's important because the response was, was framed on the basis that it was a very serious accident uh, and you might have to have an evacuation of the surrounding communities. Uh, and that was a very serious question and, and a very uh, uncertain question about whether or not you order an evacuation in, in which if you evacuate out to 20 miles, a 20 mile radius, which is uh, something that was talked about. You're talking about evacuating 600,000 people, 13 hospitals, a prison, uh, and people, and, and no one knew exactly how people would respond in a radiological emergency if there appeared to be, or if there was a major release of radiation from, from the plant. So, so evacuation was a very, very serious risk. Uh, and so policymakers had to deal with, with in, with, with only fragmentary information, had to deal with the dilemma, do you order an evacuation out to five miles, 10 miles, or 20 miles, knowing that there are gonna be costs, there are gonna be people who, who, who are injured, people who are killed, people who lose their livelihoods, the economic impact is gonna be huge. So if you order an, an evacuation, the costs uh, are likely to be heavy. But if you don't order an evacuation and the plant fails, if the containment structure that surrounds the reactor uh, is breached, then you could have a massive release of radiation with, with um, a catastrophic impact. So, so that was the problem in terms of the impact uh, on the people of central Pennsylvania. Uh, they acted with remarkable calm. Uh, there was concern, of course. There was a great deal of anxiety about what might happen with the plant. Uh, they were listening to the radio. The radio was their main source of, of information. We didn't have CNN. We didn't have uh, the internet. We didn't have, have any of the ways that we instantly get information now. Uh, the news programs were in the evening. So if you wanted to watch what was going on uh, on TV, you had to wait until the evening. So the main source of information was the radio. And, and, and people paid attention. They filled their gas tanks. They stocked their refrigerators. They paid attention to what was going on. They hoped for the best. Uh, and about um, 150,000 people uh, left and went someplace else voluntarily. There was never a mandated evacuation. 
uh, but, but it was a source of, of understandably uh, great anxiety and great uncertainty and no one knew the answers for the first uh, five days of the crisis. No one knew exactly what condition of the reactor was and no one could predict what the chances were that containment might be breached. Well, you've written a very fine book about this incident, about the Three Mile Island uh, crisis. And in it, uh, one of the characters who really stands out, or you seem to focus on, is a man named Harold Denton, who worked for the NRC. Can you tell me just what was his role in this instance? Harold Denton uh, was, was the head of what was called, still is called the Office of, of Nuclear Reactor Regulation, NRR. And NRR was, was, was the part of the agency, the, the division within the agency that had primary responsibility, as the name indicates, for uh, licensing and regulating nuclear power reactors. So it, it was an extraordinarily responsible job, was and still is. Uh, and Denton had been on that job for just a few months. Um, and he was uh, well known within the NRC and highly respected within the NRC. He, he was certainly not a public figure. Uh, until two days after the accident, uh, Joe Hendry, who was the chairman of the NRC, was called by President Carter. On, on, on Friday morning, the crisis really erupted and people really began to worry that there might be a major breach of containment, that, that evacuation might be possible and that there was a real possibility that the, uh, uh, the accident was so serious that you might have uh, a major release of radiation. Um, and so the NRC commissioners were involved and, and the president was involved. He called the chairman of, of the NRC, Joe Hendry, and he said, I want you to send your best person uh, up to the site so, so that he, uh, I don't think they used uh, he or she, I think he said he, so that he can take charge and, 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 and be in touch with me so I know what's going on up there and I can make any, any decisions that I have to make and you, the NRC will be better informed about, about what decisions uh, you need to make. Uh, and so Carter asked Henry, you know, who's the best person? And Henry kind of hedged. He says, well, probably Harold Denton or, or maybe one member of his staff. And, and, and Carter was impatient. He said, I want you to send Harold Denton. I mean, he didn't know Harold Denton from, from Adam, uh, but, but Denton was the head of the office and Henry had just said, well, Denton's probably the best guy. So, so Denton, uh, who had just come into the office, he'd been sleeping uh, because he hadn't gotten much sleep the first two days of, of the accident. This, this was day three of the accident. Uh, so, so Henry was told that, that, that he was going to Three Mile Island. Um, he was not told that he was the president's personal representative uh, at that point, but he boarded a, a White House provided helicopter with a few other NRC staff members, and they made the flight to, uh, to Three Mile and a couple of hours away by driving, I assume an, an hour or so by helicopter. Uh, and meanwhile, Carter had called Governor Thornburg, uh, Richard Thornburg was a governor of Pennsylvania, uh, and, and, and he said he was sending the best person in the country as his personal representative, and that was, was Harold Denton. So uh, Denton arrived at the site, uh, there, there, there was a visitor center right across the road from, from the plant and, and he landed in, in his helicopter. He was surrounded by news people because it was a big news story. This was on Friday the third day at about two in the afternoon. Um, and um, he told them what he knew, which wasn't much at that point. He said, look, I don't know the answers. I, I'm here to do what, what I can do to try to figure out what's going on to uh, try to uh, figure out what the dangers are and to try to, to act accordingly. Um, and <laughs> as, as Denton was arriving, he was, was, was standing there and he, he was trying to consult with his staff. His, uh, his secretary, whose name was Doris Mossberg, came up and, uh, to Denton um, and she said, um, Mr. Denton, uh, the president wants to speak with you. And Denton thought that thought that she meant the president of the company, and so he kind of you know swished her away or told her to go away. And 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 Doris and she was like this. She said, "No, no, Mr. Denton, the president of the United States wants to talk to you." <laughs> so so um, uh, 
He said, well, call him back. <laughs> and she said, well, how do I do that? She had never called the president of, of the United States. And, and he said, I don't know, that's your job. <laughs> Denton, it, it, it was a sign of, of the tension of, of, of the moment. Denton's a very easygoing, very low key uh, kind of person. Uh, but, but he was under enormous strain. Uh, the, 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 the tension was uh, palpable uh, in the area and he had a big job to do without, without much knowledge about, about how he was going to do it or what the, what the situation was. So, so he got through to, uh, to Carter. Uh, Doris called the White House switchboard and, and, and said who she was and why she was calling. So the switchboard then then put her through, uh, or put Denton through to the president. Uh, and the president told Denton, well, I wanna know what, what you know, tell me what you know. And, and Denton said, well, I don't know much of anything. And, uh, and Carter said, well, keep me posted. Uh, and in fact, for the next few days, Denton uh, had a standing order to call the president once in the morning, once in the afternoon to let him know. And Carter was, was, was very good about uh, providing communications equipment, which was um, in desperate need and other resources uh, to deal with the emergency. Um, so Denton became the, quite, quite uh, inadvertently and, and without any f preparation or foreknowledge, he became the president's representative at, at, at Three Mile Island. When, when Carter had called Thornburg, he said he was sending the best person in the country who was his personal representative. Uh, so that's how Denton became the man of the moment at, at Three Mile Island. And, and, and as was later commented, you know, he kind of rose from the, from the depths of the, of, of the, the, excuse me, the bureaucracy uh, to, to become a figure truly of, of, of worldwide renown because Three Mile and by that time was a huge, huge news story. He became the public face of the NRC. He was on television all the time and, uh, uh, and, and he was the person who was trying to explain what was happening to the public. And because this is all very technical information, uh, something that laymen aren't used to hearing, uh, how successful was he in being able to interpret for the general public what was going on there? Well, he was very good. And, and yet when I did the research on my book, I mean, the NRC was, was issuing press releases as, as was the governor and the governor was, was meeting with the press. Um, and, and what Denton said when he got there and, and when he was there, uh, and as the emergency continued for the next uh, three or four days, uh, what he said was not that much different than what the NRC was saying uh, in terms of, of, of the condition of the plant, what was known, what was not known. And of course, this was evolving. Uh, no one knew exactly what was going on and, and it kept changing and, and radiation readings kept changing, information about the possible condition of the plant, of the, of the reactor uh, kept changing. Uh, so, so there was not one source of information that, that was reliable. Um, and, and, and what Denton was saying was the same as, as others were saying. What, what Denton had, and it was a gift, it wasn't anything he was trained for or, the, or that he developed, um, was that he was easygoing, he was straightforward, uh, he didn't try to snow people. If, 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 if he was asked a question by a reporter, and he didn't know the answer, he would say, I don't know. He, he said, I hope we can find out. But often he would say, this is what I think based on what I know. And, and that frankness and that honesty and that willingness to admit, one, that the situation was very serious, uh, and two, uh, that he didn't have all the answers, uh, really impressed people. And all those people who watched him around the country, around the world, and especially in central Pennsylvania, um, really appreciated that because he was a guy who seemed like like he was he was doing the right thing and he didn't have all the answers but he was willing to uh, to admit that he was willing to offer opinions based on his expertise uh, without saying that they were sacred or unchallengeable uh, and Denton had a way about him a very appealing mannerism uh, and and and, and and people really warmed to that. And, and, and so Denton became, for the people of central Pennsylvania, certainly for Governor Thornburg and, and his staff, he became the go-to guy. He was the one who they listened to. He was the one who they believed. Uh, and um, so he became the, 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 the hero of, 
on, on Three Mile Island. Keep in mind that, 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 that he was, you know, he was two levels below the policy making apparatus of the NRC. I mean, he was an office head, uh, but, but he was not a policy maker. The policy makers were the commissioners, but the commissioners to their credit uh, deferred to him because, because he was a man on the spot. He was the expert and no one at the NRC tried to uh, elbow him out or to take, or to take uh, credit for what he was doing. Yes, it certainly gave people confidence, and that was really a major issue at a time of such uncertainty. Yeah, as much confidence as there could be. And, um, you know, I'm not sure the confidence explains what, what he did or what they had, because no one had a lot of confidence in, in what they knew, and that, was made it, and that was what made it so difficult was that was that um, by Friday, the third day of, uh, after the accident, it was clear that you had a serious situation. As I mentioned earlier, no one knew that the core had melted. If, if anyone had known or if policymakers had known that the core had melted, there would have been an evacuation immediately. Uh, and, and keep in mind, it was the governor's responsibility uh, to order an evacuation. It wasn't the president, it wasn't the NRC. The NRC advised him, uh, but it was a governor's call and, and he was trying to get the best information he could in order to uh, decide what to do. And, and he was keenly aware of the possible costs of an evacuation. It, it's a last resort, uh, but no one could be sure what the condition of the reactor was and no one could be sure what the chances are that you uh, that, that that you would set off forces that would boost containment. So so it was an agonizing situation for everyone. What what Denton contributed uh, was was partly confidence in, in his own abilities uh, and his own uh, willingness to be honest in his assessments, uh, and that was very important. But, but in terms of dealing with the accident and, and the possible consequences of, of, of the accident, uh, the big problem was that no one could be confident about anything, at least until, until Sunday after five days of, of crisis. Well, what would you say the Nuclear Regulatory Commission learned from this experience? Well, it learned number one that, um, that, that, that there were serious weaknesses in their approach to regulation that, that had to be corrected. Um, the, 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 the most glaring uh, was what came to be known as human factors. Human factors, operator training. The operators at Three Mile Island had done what they were trained to do. They were professionals. They were good at what they do. And what they did, uh, they did what they could do the morning of the accident. Uh, but they simply didn't have the training to really understand what was going on. And another major human factor was design of control rooms and control room panel uh, instrument panels. Uh, when the accident occurred, and 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 you had, um, you know, lights flashing and and annunciators sounding, so so you had chaos. But of all those instruments that were that were either making noises or lighting up, there wasn't a single one that told the operators, "Hey, you know, you have uh, coolant escaping from the core." And that has led to, uh, to uh, a, a serious accident, uh, let alone to a meltdown. And, 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 and the, the, the core did start to melt within, within an hour or two after the accident occurred. So, um, so, so the, the, the major lesson, not the only lesson, but the, 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 the major lesson was to put much more emphasis on human factors, on training, on, uh, on control room design, uh, and, and other, other um, important uh, parts of reactor safety that had not been, been emphasized in the first 25 years or so of the, of, of the reactor program. Well, the one interesting thing is that uh, people in government can never anticipate what crises will arise. Uh, that's the, they're always a surprise factor. But the question is how well people rise to the occasion uh, and how well they meet the, the needs. So would, how would you assess the way the, the both Harold Denton and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
rose to the occasion of Three Mile Island? Well, um, very well. I mean, obviously, it, it was, there, there were lots of mistakes involved in the fact that the accident happened, uh, and there were uh, mistakes involved or, or lack of planning involved in responding to the accident. Communications were, 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 were terrible. For, for a long time, people in the NRC's main offices in Washington and, and, and Bethesda couldn't get through to the plant. So they had regional, the, the NRC has a regional office near Philadelphia and there are regional people up there uh, at, at, the, at the site who were trying to relay information back but they couldn't get through or they couldn't get through in time. So, so there are all kinds of problems like, like that which, which, which had to be uh, addressed and, and have been addressed. Um, I should say that, that the NRC was charged by some people in the wake of, of the accident by caring only about the nuclear power industry and it was doing all it could to protect the industry and that's simply not true. Uh, everything the NRC did in, in, in the wake of the accident was, was designed to, to, to minimize the effects of the accident to make certain uh, to the extent that it could that it was not a major release of radiation. Uh, and to protect the public health and safety of the people of, of central Pennsylvania. Jessica Matthews, who, who worked uh, for the National Security Council and, and has been a high official in, in the State Department uh, and, and, and other high level jobs in the government. And, and, and she was, uh, at least for the first couple of days, kind of the point person uh, at, at the White House uh, for responding to TMI. And I've been on a couple of programs with her and, and she says, and I think, I think correctly, this is government at its best. You had a crisis, people responded well, they, they did what they could, uh, they didn't get in the way, uh, there was no uh, uh, jockeying for position. You had a Republican governor and a Democratic president, they got along fine. They, they, they both were committed to doing what they can to making certain that there was not a, a catastrophic uh, event or catastrophic release of radiation. Um, and, and the bureaucracy did what it was supposed to do in terms of responding to the accident, in terms of, of gathering the, uh, uh, the best information it could, and then um, uh, responding accordingly. I, I mean, it took, it took five days to figure out pretty much what was going on, although there was still a lot that was unknown. But, but by Sunday, after five days, um, it was clear that the reactor, if not under control, was at least much more under control than it had been. Uh, and, and, and the tension uh, eased and the crisis ended. Um, and, and in those five days, you, you had to collect a great deal of information from experts around the entire country. Uh, and that's what the NRC did. That's what uh, other agencies did. That's what the White House did. And certainly that's what the state of Pennsylvania did. So, so Jessica's comment that it was government at its best, I, I, I think is appropriate. I would agree with that. Very good. And you've, of course, written a very fine book on the subject. Tell me, were all the records open to you? All the records were, were open. Uh, a lot of the records, I, I don't think there was anything that I looked at um, that wasn't available uh, within a short time after the accident. Uh, and. Uh, there, there, there was a, a presidential commission that was formed by President Carter shortly after the accident, the Kemeny Commission, and then the NRC had its own uh, extensive uh, review, uh, which was a highly critical review of the NRC. It certainly was not a whitewash. Um, and and so, so, so between FOIAs and um, requests from Congress um, and the, uh, the workings of the Kemeny Commission and the NRC's internal report, um, virtually everything was open. Uh, what, what, what had opened fairly recently before I did the book uh, were, were the records of the Committee Commission. Uh, and, and the Committee Commission had done all kinds of interviews. So you had, had depositions that were done under oath uh, with, with uh, key people uh, who were involved in, in the accident in, in the state and the utility and the NRC and the White House uh, all over. Uh, and they were marvelous sources. So, so, so there was a, uh, an abundance of sources. And, and of course, as always in our trade, uh, or as often in our trade, uh, the, the problem is to try to condense it into a, a, a fairly 
concise book and, and a readable book. Um, so no, in terms of access to 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 records and um, most of what I used, and, and I'm trying to think if there was anything that I used that 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 wasn't public, and there might have been a couple of things, but not much, nothing of consequence. Well, very good. Sam, are there any questions that I should have asked that I haven't asked? Yeah, you should have asked about the effects of the of, of, of the accident. We, we had a core meltdown at, 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 at Three Mile Island, and, and I'm not gonna talk about the hydrogen bubble. I used, the, the, the hydrogen bubble, the, 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 the fact that, uh, well, I won't get in, in, into the details, but 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 there was concern. There, there was a hydrogen hydrogen bubble that formed in the top of the pressure vessel. The pressure vessel is a is a container that holds the fuel rods, it holds a reactor. Uh, it's 36 feet high. It has uh, steel walls that are nine inches thick, or at least it did at, at three mile. And uh, and at the top of that container, at the top of the pressure vessel, was a hydrogen bubble which had formed when the fuel rods were destroyed by the accident. And there was concern that that hydrogen bubble might become flammable or might become uh, uh, or might explode. Uh, and if that happened, then you could possibly have a breach of the uh, pressure vessel. And if that happened, you could possibly have the core falling down into the containment building. And if that happened, you could possibly have a breach of the, 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 the four foot walls of the, of, of the containment building. And that's what, what everyone was afraid of. Well, none of that happened. Uh, and the amount of, of, of radiation was huge within, this, uh, with, within the pressure vessel and within the containment structure, uh, but only very small amounts of at least the most dangerous forms of, of radiation uh, escaped the building. Uh, tiny amounts of, of iodine-131 and none that were, were detected of, of, of other dangerous forms of radiation. So, so in spite of the uh, severity of the accident, um, the plant held, and, and that's important for people to know. There were no, no, uh, no deaths from Three Mile Island, uh, and cancer rates from all the evidence that we have, and there's a lot of evidence, uh, cancer rates have not increased uh, in the area. Very different than the situation in Chernobyl just a few years later. Chernobyl uh, is still the worst uh, nuclear power disaster in, in world history, and, and Fukushima is somewhere between. Fukushima was not as bad as Chernobyl, uh, but they were both far worse than Three Mile Island. Um, and, and Three Mile Island is still the worst accident uh, in, in in this country, uh, but but the effects, at least the health effects, were uh, were minimal. Well, Sam, thank you very much. This has really been a very enlightening uh, interview. <laughs> I've enjoyed uh, hearing it. I've read your book now yeah, twice, and uh, and uh, oh, well, well, thank you, Don. Yeah, I read it last night too, and I said, yeah, this is pretty good. <laughs> It's amazing. The book came out in 2004 in time for the 25th anniversary. So, so it's been a while since I've, I've worked on it and, and, and I'd forgotten a lot of what was in that book. So it's, it was uh, if not fun. At least I, I it, it was nostalgic for me to, uh, to, to look at that book again. Well, a useful reminder. So. <laughs> <laughs> To learn more, visit the webpage History at the Federal Government, provided by the Society for History in the Federal Government.